that we've bashed enough professionals, we we need to actually discuss what is the solution. What is the solution, and what paradigm do we need to bring back, or what paradigm do we need, do we need to work with? And the solution that I found alongside Ricky Guy is to you know share examples of beautiful legacies and civil of the civilizations that we've had in the past. So example of that is in the Ottomans. Time, time of the Ottomans. In the Ottoman schools, they had a motto that they would graffiti on the walls. They would say, "Here, no fish will be forced to fly, and no bird will be forced to swim." What we have nowadays is, you know, we've got pressure from the parents. Put their doctor, bani, na bani, lawyer, bani, engineer, bani. You know, and then you've got pressure from your friends. And then you compare if you're a doctor or you're not a doctor. If you're a lawyer or not a lawyer, then you're inferior or superior. And all these pressures that surround you suppress your ability to express yourself. That's the fundamental thing. When you suppress, and what is depression? Let me give you what, and I'm not sure what depression is. Depression is the suppression of the soul or your spirit, if you want. Want to take it from a wider context? When you suppress your spirit, when you spirit, when you spiritually suppressed, then your body becomes tight, and eventually you become depressed. And so, in the time of the Ottomans, they were very wise. You know, they created syllabus for each individual based on the unique. Talents and abilities. Each child has had his own syllabus based on his key strengths and his abilities. And this is something that you know, as we work through this module, I will, I will be hoping that will be unlocked within you, because this is what I've designed this module on. So bringing back this teaching philosophy. But what was the advantage, and what is the advantage of having such ways of teaching? Is the question. Now, I want to illustrate this through some amazing personalities that we've had in the Muslim legacy, Islamic legacy, and Islamic empire. Because the thing is, in the Islamic world, largely there is an inferiority complex. People are asking the question, "What have we done? What have we actually achieved?" When they look back on the century, and they don't even look back on the century because people don't study history that much. Even if they do, they only study very little of what they're taught. And when they look back, they say, "Hamne to kuch yehi nahi. AC dekhe, computer dekhe, phone dekhe. Everything is invented by the West. We haven't even done anything." People aspire to Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. When it comes to what have we invented, we have. And then it, when you come to the Nobel Peace Prize winners, <laughs> we see. <laughs> Blanks firing all over, right? So we were like, we haven't done anything, and then that creates an inferiority complex. But you see, knowledge does not evolve that way. Knowledge always evolves through civilizations. This is how it's traditionally been done. It's always been passed on and it's moved on. And the reality is, Islamic civilizations have done a lot. It's just that the awareness has not been given, and I'll share with you a few examples. But if you want to look into further work, I'd really recommend you look into the work of uh, Professor Slim Al Hasni of uh, Foundation of Technology, Science, and Civilization, who I had the pleasure of spending time with in Manchester, and he's written an amazing book called One Thousand and One Inventions: The Enduring Muslim Legacy. Basically, what Was the contribution of the Muslims to science and technology and history and civilization? So one of the examples I want to share with you is of a lady, and again, you know, when when the word of contribution and lady, Islamic lady, comes in, you know, we start scratching our, our heads because Islam is taught as against females. But anyway, I want to share an amazing story with you of an inspirational lady from the ninth century. Her name was Fatma Al Firi. Fatma Al Firi, the story goes, inherited. She inherited Fatma Al Firi inherited 
a huge vast amount of wealth from her parents. Her and her sister Maryam at the time, they lived in Morocco Fez, okay? And they thought, what can we do with this wealth? Now the question I want to ask you guys is if you were inherited a lot of wealth in this day and age, what would you do? Would you build a mansion? Would you move to California? Build a mansion? Would you buy a red Ferrari? <laughs> what would you do? Buy a private jet? If you inherited a lot of money. Now Fatma and Firi, now let's go back to their time. Fatma and Firi and Maryam could have done the same. They could have built a palace instead of a mansion. They could have bought red camels, which were equivalent of Ferraris at the time. But instead they didn't. What did they decide to do? So Fatma had a dream. She had a vision. She said she wanted to bring all the best scholars and academics to one place. And she brought together the academics from all over the world to Morocco Fez. The first ever university on the world she created. The first ever university was created by Fatma Firi in the year 859 in Morocco Fez. University of Karayun. Okay. The first university, the other university, first university in the Muslim lands to appear, emerge after that was in 969 Al Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. Okay, then after that, the first ever European university was in 1088, was the University of Bologna, Italy. Then after that, the first ever university to appear in UK, Britain, was the University of Oxford, 1167. Then after that, Cambridge, 1209. Then after that, the first ever university in America, almost twice the time after the, uh, the first ever university on the planet, was the University of Harvard, much in, in the United States, basically in 1636. 1636, the first ever university in the United States. And then the University of Manchester where I went, <laughs> okay, um, after the merger to 2004, but originally it was UMIST. And so this is what happens when you have a vision and you're performing on a purpose. You know when you know your purpose, you know, guess what happens? Energy flows in the four dimensions. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And when energy flows in four dimensions, what happens is you get rapid manifestation. You can achieve something as bringing a, the first ever university and the best scholars to one platform. In a lifetime, being a female. So even genders are not, are not an issue. <laughs> You know, although they say they suppress uh, the suppression of genders in Islam, etc., that's not the case. And this is how beautiful the University of Karayun looks—a uh, complete masterpiece.